Some farmers plant cover crops in the fall and early spring to do a number of things, help fix nitrogen in the soil so they don't have to fertilize as much uh, at other times, prevent erosion, improve water absorption. Dave Gentry is an expert on cover crops for agriculture giant Growmark. In Iowa, use of cover crops has risen from about 10,000 acres in 2009 to more than 300,000 acres last year. What's the trend in Illinois? trend in Illinois is very similar. We see very quick growth many farmers taking a look at it partially for forage. We've had a shortage due to the drought back in 2012 of forage for livestock and it gives them another source to graze their cattle on. We also see uh, nutrient management plans that are allowing them to save as many nutrients as possible and keep them out of the groundwater. Did farmers use more cover crops before the advent of the fertilizer age? Farmers used cover crops uh, very early in agriculture. We didn't truly understand the soil erosion issues that they were benefiting us for, but it gave us more feed. We were much more livestock-oriented agriculture back before the fertilizer age, and this gave us some place to graze or put up hay. How much erosion can a, a cover crop prevent? Well, cover crops do a really nice job because the when selected properly, they have a really fibrous root system and they hold that surface soil in place. So you can stop almost all soil runoff with a good band of cover crops along the edge of a field as a buffer strip or just keep it in place throughout the field. How much can cover crops boost nitrogen in the soil? The ability to build nitrogen is, it's a good one, but it has some trade-offs. You can generally build anywhere from 30 to 70 pounds of nitrogen if you use a clover or some other type of legume as a cover crop, vetch, hairy vetch being another one that's popular. The trade-off is most of that nitrogen comes later in the spring and it would delay corn planting. So it makes it a little more difficult for the typical commercial farmer because it would delay him past the prime planting season. What has changed in the farmer's economic calculations of time and money to bring cover crops back into viability? I believe the 2012 drought was the trigger or the tipping point to make cover crops in Illinois much more feasible. We had a short crop due to the drought, and we left a lot of nutrient unused. And so the farmers were able to put cover crops on and use them as a sponge to soak up whatever leftover nitrogen, potential phosphates that were left in the soil, hold on to them through the winter, and then in the spring as they start to decay, release them back to the soil. So we saw the, the I hate to use the term perfect storm, of poor crops in 12, which led to using more cover crops to save those nutrients for the 2013 crop. Are they gonna go away from that in, in times of better moisture? I think that they saw the benefits not only in the nutrients saved, but in the soil tilth, or the ability of the soil to remain soft, not hard, no hard pack, a better environment to plant corn and plant soybeans in. I think more and more farmers are starting to see those benefits beyond just straight, pure economic ones. And so I see cover crops continuing to expand as we improve our soil health. What's the percentage of uh, Illinois farmers who use cover crops, and what's the percentage that could reasonably use cover crops? Not every piece of land is, is, would work for it. Certainly every piece of land would not work. Uh, wherever there's a slope, those uh, areas, southern Illinois, western Illinois, where we have a little more rugged uh, topography, in those areas where we've gotten out of the field early, wheat areas where they have the the ground sitting vacant for most of the summer. Um, I think we're still learning here in the heart of Illinois uh, the ability to save nutrients and to improve soil tilth. When we have such beautiful soils here in McLean County, it is hard to uh, It's a tough sale to make. It's a tough sale to make. But at the same time, uh, if it can improve other aspects, one of the things that we found with cover crops is that we can 
drain the soils a little quicker in the spring, allowing quicker access to the fields. And in a year like we had this past year with the heavy rainfalls, if they can get back into the fields quicker, that's a benefit. Peas, rye, radishes, alfalfa, clover, turnips, uh, you mentioned a couple as well. They all work in different places as a cover crop and all have different costs and trade-offs. How do farmers choose? They have to work with their local crop specialist or do their own research. I think it's critical to understand that cover crop is the critical term. So they have to manage it like they manage their other crops. It's not as simple as throw the seed out and come back in the spring and and work around it. So it really depends on what their goal is. Do they need feed for animals? Are they just trying to provide a nutrient sink or sponge to soak up nutrients? Are they just trying to hold the soil in place? Then they can choose the right product accordingly. Cover crops need rain too. Late fall and early spring growing conditions can be even more variable than the seasons for standard commodities. Is How much of a barrier is this? Fall rains are always an important thing. Some farmers are now starting to aerial apply. In other words, use an airplane to fly them on in mid-August where they have an opportunity to receive the rains of September or before we might get the crop off, get started. And then once we release them by taking the crop off, let more sunlight get to them and let them grow, then they can get established and get through the winter. So that's one of the tools that we're starting to see, more early planting using airplanes. Should farmers use more than one type of cover crop in a given plot? The early data that we're seeing don't show any real pluses. One of the things that we do see a benefit in having multiples, and usually we're talking only two, we're talking a a grass and something like a radish or a turnip or going to a, a legume with a little bit of grass in it. The benefits that we see there is the diversity and the different root structures that help break up the soil. Is it absolutely necessary? Not really. They can fly on, go with something like a cereal rye late in the year, or a, we call them tillage radishes. They are really large tubers. Uh, They can get anywhere from 18 to 24 inches long and can be four to six inches in diameter. Uh, Use those and alone or in a mix. Are tillage radishes edible for those uh, non-farm background people who might be thinking that? Actually, they are. Uh, One of the jokes that I have made with our crop specialists is the new thing to put in their their bag to carry with them is a salt shaker. Because (laughs) as those radishes get in size, usually in November and uh, early December, if they haven't frozen, uh, they actually are pretty good. A lot of farmers leave them in, though, and then the root decays over the winter, and, and what, a, what benefit comes from that? It's an interesting uh, concept in that the radish grows both above and below ground, and then the root below the tuber breaks up the soil. As the radish dies in the winter, it collapses on itself, and then in the spring when the warm weather comes, it rots, much like you would in a compost But as it rots away, it leaves the walls of the soil these really nice holes that can be used for drainage to not only allow surface water to get into the subsoil, but at the same time uh, allow quicker drainage so we can start to farm the ground in the spring a little bit earlier. What's the federal policy history on cover crops? The federal government has become much more aware and I've had the opportunity to work with USDA and RCS, they have programs in place now where they can work with farmers and help, whether it's in the planning phase or in actual financial support, to get cover crops, especially on highly erodible land or land that for some reason has some challenges production-wise. So there are some programs in place. In addition, they are also supporting research and uh, other avenues that we can spread the word on use of cover crops. Are there fewer disincentives to planting cover crops from the federal perspective than there used to be? I don't know that there's fewer disincentives. Um, The one thing you got to keep in mind is they have to be managed. And so come spring, it's important for the farmer to understand if he wants to get his crop in on time, he needs to get his cover crop out of the way, whether he tills it in, sprays it out, it needs to be managed. So I don't know that there's governmental disadvantages, 
but there are management disadvantages that have to be addressed. Uh, this past spring where we had a lot of rain, some people who tested and tried cover crops found out that they didn't get into them quick enough to get them killed, and then they become more of a weed. For a price of 345 for a pound of seed for tillage radishes or, or something like that, mm-hmm. what's the farmer's break-even point? I mean, what does he have to gain to make that worth his while or her while? You've struck on a very challenging question. I don't know that we've been good at being able to put a dollar figure on the benefits. We know that delayed planting can cost us yield in both corn and soybeans. And so the ability to get a field dried out and get the spring tillage done, get in with a no-till planter earlier in the season, has some very distinct yield benefits to the crop going in. Can we actually find a benefit to that dollar and cent wise? uh, We haven't been very good at being able to pull that kind of research off. On the other hand, let me add that for those farmers that have livestock, it does improve their feed throughout the winter. So they can put a cereal rye, a turnip, a forage turnip on a field in the fall. It's going to grow in the corn stalks and they can let the cattle graze the corn stalks and the turnips and the cereal rye. How many farmers does that really apply to though? Most farmers are either commodities or beef guys. For those who are grazing beef cattle, it's exceptional. If for they have a small number of cattle where they're just going to cut them loose on the, on the field, it really works well. But most farmers don't do both. Right. For a, uh, a cash grain farmer, he's going to take a look at the benefits of how it helps next year's crop or If he left nutrients behind, and I think this is the one part that we take a good look at, if he didn't utilize all of the nitrogen that he put on last year in this year's crop, he has the opportunity to grab a hold of it, hold it into that radish sponge or into the cereal rye or triticale uh, plants and save that for next year's crop. That's money that's not getting out of his pocket nor out of his field. Can he test the soil late enough to make it timely to apply a cover crop? Because if he has to decide whether to put in a cover crop in August, September, the nitrogen levels may not be where they are later on. Uh, Correct. Nitrogen is a very mobile nutrient, and throughout the year it's going to move in the soil. If we have a wet midsummer, he may actually have percolation up from the bottom and have more nitrogen than he anticipated. It may be more of an art than a science at this moment in time, but if he looks at fertilizing for 200 bushels of corn, and when he comes in and takes it out, it's 180, he knows that he's probably left some nitrogen behind. The other side of that is, if there is no nitrogen there, the crops don't respond. They are very nitrogen sensitive, and so if he He may invest in some seed. If it doesn't respond, if it doesn't grow very effectively, the sign to him is, I got my nitrogen out with my corn crop. How will climate change impact use of of cover crops in Illinois? Tougher, easier, fewer benefits, more, what? I believe that as we've seen the extremes showing up, and obviously we've just come through some very severe fall storm, Having the the cover crop there to cut down on erosion definitely gives him some some very good soil benefits. As we see the extremes of of drought and the extremes of really wet springs, wet falls, again, this can neutralize it quite a bit because it, it helps the soil structure as we move forward. Dave Gentry is an expert on cover crops for Growmark. Thanks for joining us. Thank you, Charlie. I'm Charlie Schlenker, WGLT News.